All right, folks, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Roaster warm-up sessions. As you can see, if you're watching, if you're watching this on YouTube or even Spotify, if you're watching, uh, the environment is definitely not the same. Um, you may hear other sounds. Um, actually, I don't know if the mics are picking up. There is a call to prayer going on um, because we are in Lombok, Indonesia with our uh, very dear friend, Taylor, and we'll uh, dive into talking about uh, today's topic. We have a lot to talk about. It's It's been um, it's been one heck of a trip. I am also like, j just folks, all the, I try to bring as much gear as possible on this trip. Um, I have the mic, uh, Taylor's in a lapel. I'm trying to monitor our levels right now and make sure I am not clipping. So with that said, um, just extend a little bit of grace for this episode. Uh, it may not go as planned, but we are excited to bring you, um, some tasty, tasty content. Um, again, I'm going to continue with the apologies, you know? Um, I'm wearing shorts. I don't wear shorts yeah, like, yeah, in the shocked. United States. Like I'm people shocked. probably have never seen me in shorts. I'm also f in flip flops. I don't wear flip flops. Um, but we have like, you know, when in Indo, be like an Indo person, right? right. Cool. Um, I did brew some coffee. It is not batch brew. So um, let's uh, let's try this AeroPress brew. I'll be honest with you guys. It's kind of rough. <laughs> what is rough? The AeroPress brew or the the water? Oh, the water. Well, the brew, but the water yeah. is the, the main culprit here. I mean, I, I, I want to say this is the water awful that, extraction. It's just the textures yeah, are yeah. so weird. The water used was the free water we got in the hotel. And yeah. it's a local water source with a lot, a lot of minerals that's unstable. So, yeah. yeah, not yeah, surprised. Totally. I mean, still, it's got, like, flavors. Definitely, Everything's. Yeah very like kind of muted i don't yeah. it's not necessarily like not high clarity here yeah. you know yeah so but hey it's aeropress brew speaking of aeropress that one dude that brewed us an aeropress brew was unreal he's a legend man phenomenal i have so much respect for that guy just yeah, uh, what was the cafe's name again uh it's called bonjour so it, it means uh to stop on by in the local language so bonjour coffee in north lombok um yeah it's they're a very small shop, really grassroots, just amazing young indigenous Sasa guys that are doing it. Like they're dedicated to the cause, they're growing the coffee community in the north, which is vastly different from the community here mm -hmm. in the city. So these two guys, Yoga and Gita, they're dedicating so much of their time, their resources, their energy uh, to pour into young people, people younger than them. Um, they're doing trainings for free, education for free. They're just really uh, dedicated to the cause. And yeah, just really, they're the ones, one of the big players that are growing and pioneering the community in North Lombok yeah. for coffee. For, and what I, what I mean is the coffee scene, so the cafe scene. So yeah. obviously there's a lot of coffee growers, coffee farmers, but these two young guys, uh, they're really focusing on the, the culture, the third wave culture, the cafe culture, and uh, doing that through education. Um, and they're just really, they're dedicating a lot and I have so much respect for them and they use our cafe a lot. We use our seedling program. We've invited them into to learn, like they've been part of filling poly bags, um, germinating the seeds. Um, we've invited to the farms. Uh, they played a huge role in planting 700 new Arabica coffee trees for one of our farmers. And yeah, they're great content creators as Phenomenal. well. And like yeah. really gifted in, in uh, creativity and art, you know, communication through social media they're amazing guys yeah i have so much respect for them yeah yeah i'm meeting them hearing what you have to say about them i'm like these folks are really aligned with like everything that you and i have talked about Definitely. for years like yeah. our dream goes back to uh the story that i've probably shared on the podcast before that we've talked about a lot like yeah. sitting at the taco truck on the side of the road for sure and um deciding to go into specialty coffee because we wanted not only to have tasty beverages that was mm. part of it but that was not the main thing the main thing was seeing how we can impact the supply chain impact the people mm. that work in coffee yeah. um and also like foster and create community that was so a big, big thing for us yeah. Um, so now we're in Indo, you live there, you live here, there, yeah. I'm coming here. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we've been working on this project for what, close to how many years now? 
Well, I've been in the Indo for 10, and then like we started having these conversations, and we did our first coffee school together the end of 2016, I believe, yeah. That's, that Somewhere sounds about right, yeah. yeah, end of 2016. Yeah, we did our yeah. first SEA school together as a yeah, barista. I, inter, I think it was Foundations of Coffee and Barista, if I'm not right. mistaken. Um, so that was like what kicked it off for sure. I had been in Indo prior to that, and similar to what you just said about, yeah, being here and seeing you know, the poverty and the people stuck in poverty, it's, it's a really disheartening thing to see that. And it's like, when you come from a country with so many resources and you, you move to a developing country, you're just shocked at the way people live their lives and how they do things day to day. So, you know, that question arose in my heart, like, okay, I'm here, what do I do? What can I do to elevate the, the level of people's lives here? You know, like, how can, how can I have a positive impact here? Yeah. And um, yeah. One of the biggest things, and I think you would agree with this, was that we don't want to bring in foreign things because foreign things never last. So it's like right. you see a lot of foreign aid and things like that, but if it's not sustainable by the local people, it's really pointless to do. Um, you know, so it's like, what is the common thread amongst the people in Indonesia, or uh, you know, what's what's something that's already here? And coffee was a big deal. You know, right. every conversation I had was over coffee. Every every relationship that was deepening or when people invite me over it's always coffee that's a really special thing in Lombok um, every individual has their own coffee they're roasting their own coffee in a little clay pot you know a little yep. clay wok thing so that was a big thing it was like man what's already here that can impact the lives you know like, what are things that are not uh, you know being utilized or that could be even raised up so the coffee was the common thread in that for sure so yeah and I, I think within that it's like not a lot of folks talk about Indonesian coffee, especially in specialty circles. Um, of course, there's the you know COE coffees. There's uh, like some of the champion co championship coffees that we hear about. Mm -hmm. But in general, um, Indonesia hasn't like been known for producing the cream of the crop you know, best coffee in the world, but there's a lot going on in with Indonesian coffees. Um, the cafes that we visited on this trip, like I've been mind blown. I'm like, where did, like, where did this yeah. come from? You know, uh, uh, big shout out to Rota Coffee. We went oh, um, to was Phenomenal, Call they're a you. roasting company. Yeah. Yep. Um, what, uh, what was the other with the H? Harmos Brew. Harmos Brew was yeah. just a phenomenal yeah. experience. Um, yeah. Like beautiful cafes, mm -hmm. uh, tasty coffees. Um, I was completely blown away. The coolest thing is um, almost all of these coffee uh, cafes and coffee roasters are using Indonesian coffee. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that seems to be a very positive trend for sustainability for coffee that is grown here also stays in the country and gets predominantly used. Yeah. Um, you've been here longer than me. So what have you noticed that's like within coffee that's progressed? You know, what has oh, changed yeah. over the last Yeah, time? the landscape has completely changed. Like I remember coming here in 2014, there was one coffee shop that was like considered specialty or third wave, you know? And I mean, even then they weren't, they weren't, they, I would say they had dialed in espresso, really good stuff, but it mm -hmm. wasn't like they weren't focused on pour overs or any really thing crazy or unique. But yeah, the landscape has completely changed and I would say accessibility is a huge thing. So yeah, people, there's a big wave of that as well. So it's really just amazing to see like cafes popping up everywhere, the local, you know, investment and people, ownership is a big thing, you know what I mean? Like people really, like there's people that have, seen a bigger picture of what coffee can be. Um, I know personally some guys that like, you know, they left Lombok to do university and then, you know, they got, ex they experienced the cafe culture in Java, which was a little bit further ahead. And then coming back to Lombok, wanting to start things, wanting to do local things like that. So definitely it's, it's, a, it's an amazing, uh, the landscape is just completely changing over the, the years. Yeah. It's crazy. Within the cafe, if you compare the cafe experience here, mm. But then um, kind of take that same point of view and look at coffee producing. Mm. Um, what has changed or what's new within like coffee producing that you've noticed? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think directly like related to the impact of coffee producing for, for quality anyways, or third wave coffee is definitely I've seen it's a big wave of, you know, baristas wanting that unique coffee and kind of doing the hard work themselves like, dude, in Indonesia, we're extremely privileged because there 
no, almost no matter where you are, there could be an origin like two hours away, sometimes as close as an hour away. Yeah. So it's like these shops have uh, shops and roasters have direct access to farmers. So it just it take, it takes a lot of the groundwork um, and just about what people are looking for. So I've seen a lot of shops like, you know, looking for those unique coffees. Some of them have put in the groundwork themselves. Um, yeah, obviously outside players, like I know of, you know, people that have come to this country like to, you know, help raise the quality of coffee and specialty producing and things like that. And yeah, it's just, Obviously, quality control is a big deal, you know, mm -hmm. the, the detail oriented, the, the QC side of things. Um, that's that's a major step. Um, facilities, you know, are a big deal as well. Sometimes these farmers, um, they don't have the startup or the model or the investment to to, re to make nice facilities. Um, a method that we use um, is we kind of go half and half a little bit, you know, like for the netting or the drying things. Uh, we ask them to supply the wood and do the building. So like sometimes there's that 50, 50%, you know, it's like we kind of, okay, we're willing to invest this much if you'll go meet us halfway a little bit. So um, definitely it's hard for them. Rarely do I see, and I don't mean this in a bad way. It's just, and we, we've talked about this in this trip where it's just the mindset of, you know, longevity and really what's worth things. So it really, sometimes it takes that outside uh, individual coming in and saying, hey, this is what your coffee could be. This is, you know, there are people looking for coffees like these. So it does sometimes take that outside influence to come in and, and you know, explain, you know, what the, what the outside market is looking for. Right. Um, I don't want to be too long winded here, but that was the, the story that I, you know, have, have seen in my personal experiences. When I got up there, you know, these farmers had some knowledge about processing and, and you know, care of farm and things like that uh, that were implemented by an NGO um, for a few years. Um, you know, they were, the NGO had come in in 2016 and started, you know, teaching them about Arabica coffee grafting, so grafting on Arabica trees to Robusta, but the NGO pretty much just left them high and dry for marketing. So they're like, okay, we have all this knowledge, like why would we produce if there's no market in the end? So uh, when I came in, that was like the final link to the chain, the supply chain was like, okay, like I was surprised at how much they already knew even. It's like, whoa, these guys are already doing some of these things, but then it's like, okay, but like, we have no incentive to do these things because there's no outside market. So that was a big deal. Right. So uh, you see that a lot where it's like, okay, we got knowledge, what do we do with it? And what, what's the final step to actually, you know, getting impactful change of like, you know, obviously higher money, greater living, things like that, you know, so. Yeah, man, that's, that's Sorry, a that lot. Was a mouthful. No, that was <laughs> awesome. That, that's a lot, a lot of insight. Um, going back a little bit, you did talk about, um, you t you, throughout this whole trip in general, we've been really talking about just processing. Um, you mentioned that natural processed coffees are so much more popular now um, than they were before. Um, and that, and I think to me, that's a little bit of a shocker because a lot of the experimental processings, um, usually we talk about or think about like other major producing nations that produce a lot of specialty. Um, but when we think of Indonesian coffees, a lot of the times it's kind of like everyone assumes everything's wet hold, oh, which no. isn't true. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of tasty uh, coffees here that are being like produced and uh, processed in very different ways. Can you share more about that? Because you're, you're, you're producing stuff that's natural, honey, yeah. that's semi-washed. Um, you're doing a lot of yeah. stuff. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, I think well, the, the gift, I think, that the coffee community gives to everyone involved is like the open kind of shared resources. Like, man, like when Koji came out, it was like, here's the recipe, do it, you know? So you definitely see that like impact is amazing where it's like, oh, there's free knowledge and resources a lot of places. And like, it's all for the good of the market, you know? So definitely like I would say from my personal experience, you're seeing a lot of like crazy fruit bomb coffees. And I know we cupped a few and I bought, um, some uh, coffees from the the winner of the national Indonesian roaster. Um, so we bought 120 hour natural ferment anaerobic fermentation. Which you, you said it was fermenty, and I totally see where you're coming from that. But you see generally a lot of what maybe the West would considered, uh, yeah, very fermenty coffee. It's a big thing now, like big fruit bombs. 
at locals, like the, even the producers, there's this funny process called a wine process where they do over a month long fermentation and it's super whiny, um, but the locals love it. Um, more so like that producer level. Right. But uh, for third wave and stuff, you see a lot of like natural, natural anaerobic. Um, people on the ground now are even doing koji processing. Um, one of the bigger companies, Space Coffee Roastery has done koji. Um, so definitely, uh, People are looking for those unique fruit bombs. We had a coffee at this little guy's shop, uh, this little shop near the Gillies, and he served us this coffee that was just an amazing, like floral jasmine thing. So it's that was definitely, yeah, yeah, people are looking for that for sure on the ground, like those really strong fruit, fruity coffees, definitely. Yeah. So there's a lot of advancement going on in definitely. processing as well. Now let's even um, step. A, a little farther back and let's talk about coffee farming yeah. um, we got to visit one of the main farms that you work with yeah. um, that you've been able to harvest both Arabica and Robusta because Robusta does make up a major part and yeah. we can maybe touch a little bit on why that's still like a major part of yeah. what you do yeah. Um, but yeah a beautiful farm great farm massive potential like I was completely surprised by the potential like everywhere we went there were coffee trees yeah. not all of them were taken care of but a lot of them were like just very nice coffee trees and properly taken care of mm -hmm. and then um we met Adi and we talked to Adi and he had a lot of insight one of the things he did mention is like you were saying that you basically helped create the market for this coffee yeah. because at one point it was just nothing um and you also mentioned something crazy let's talk about pricing yeah. Because you've had people approach you and offer you how much per kilo? I mean, what's what's two hundred thousand? Yeah. Uh, oh man, it's almost twenty bucks. Yeah, a kilo. Like, yeah. Funny thing, like I did this natural anaerobic. That's like nine bucks a pound. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I did a funny natural anaerobic. I had just about three kilos, which is around six pounds. And this kid was looking for a competition coffee, and I'd already roasted some and brewed it. So he's like, "Man, we really want this unique story to be told." As he's he's doing a Brewers Cup next month, um, just in our coffee community, um, or for the island. And uh, I was like, "Look, man, like, this is what it's cost at. Like, if, if this is what you want, like, I'll, I'll I'll sell it to you." Like, I didn't plan I didn't plan on selling it. It was just a fun experimental batch for me. Um, but he was like, no, like that's totally worth it if it's a unique story, if if he knows it's impacting the farmer. So, yeah, it's it's quite amazing for sure. So I was shocked. I was like, I gave him the number. I was like, I don't even know if this is a, uh, if this is gonna work. Like, I was yeah. like he might just totally reject it. So it's like, that's okay with me. But, but yeah, like you were saying, um, yeah, we we dabble in both because uh, Lombok does produce a lot of robusta. Um, and for those that don't know, uh, almost every Indonesian coffee shop uses robusta. So you've got blends, um, like kind of latte, like iced lattes are a big thing with brown sugar here, like they have a name for it in Indonesian, called Kopi Susu. So it's a, uh, that is like the largest market to sell for. It's like, it's instant, it's quick. Um, people do a lot of like coffee concentrate. So it's like, you have these really small startups. It's just basically like iced flavored coffee, uh, iced flavored milk coffee, and it's really easy to do. Um, so Robusta is a huge market. Like I was actually afraid to get into Robusta in the beginning. Um, like I came in for Arabica and then uh, I found out, I was like, oh man, these guys are producing a lot of Robusta. And I was really worried about like, oh man, they're looking to me like, Taylor, can you help us with this Robusta stuff? And I was like, I don't know what I'm, I don't even know if there's a market for it, but I was like, I'll give it a shot. And then we started producing some, uh, the term would be fine Robusta, but it felt, you know, specialty Robusta, fine Robusta, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we started producing that and like, now we've got too much demand for, than product, so that's crazy. Um, and we've helped them, you know, sometimes du more than doubling their price per kilo. Um, and yeah, that's just, man, when coffee is good, it basically sells itself, you yeah, know, like, sure. it's like, all I've done is give out samples to shops, roasters. Are you interested in this coffee? It's impacting these people directly. It's like, it's, you know, sometimes I don't even take the profit. It's just connecting the two. Yeah. So, and yeah, I've got more demand right now than product. Yeah. So it's What's crazy. the price difference between Arabic and Robusta? So, like, if you're doing like specialty processed Arabica anaerobic style or anything like that, you could be, you know, using Indonesian rupiah, like, you know, it could be 150,000 rupiah or, you know, that's like, say, 10 bucks or five, 10 bucks for a kilo, but say five pounds, five, five dollars a pound, give or take a little bit. And then Robusta is going to be about 40,000 a kilo. So like, say, two bucks a pound, 
too okay. much a pound. So it, yeah, like you, it could be as much as, you know, five times the price for Arabica and stuff. So um, that's why we're, the, one of the farms we're working with, Adi, we're, he is the one really serious guy about coffee. So he's actually slowly moving his farm from a Robusta farm to a Arabica farm. And he was the guy who said that we planted, you know, a bunch of new trees. Um, and we've done free seedling programs for uh, new varietals to plant in the area and things like that. So we're working with him on that. Um, but we're open to whoever wants to work. We want, we want to help them market their coffee. We want to help them process it. We want to get it to roasters and cafes and things like that. So I think there's a huge potential definitely. Yeah. Like, and I know we cup some Robusta. I don't know, you know, in your mind, the, maybe the Western market isn't ready for it, but you know, I, I know what to expect from it, so I think it's enjoyable. You know, like, yeah. it goes really good with, like, sweetened condensed milk and a Vietnam drip brew. Like, I've been blown away, like, the creaminess and the chocolatey, like, nougat and vanilla. Like, it's nothing, like, super complex, but I think in the right drinks, it can really surprise you. Like, I've been, I, like, made one just as, like, you know what, I haven't tried this in a while, I'll give it a shot, brew this v Vietnam drip, and I was, like, blown away, so... Yeah, I, th I think it has I mean, Cupping place. it was super fun because yeah. uh, I don't cup Robusta a lot. Mm -hmm. um, we did for our SEA school. Um, I've bought Robusta in the United States just to kind of, you know, keep things in check just to see where, where it is. Um, I've never been impressed, but, but I got to say your Robusta, especially the lighter roast yeah. um, that happened because we roast. I watched y'all roast yeah, it yeah, too. Yeah. Um, I was quite surprised with the amount of acidity that was still pleasant yeah, yeah. in it or present in it. And it was pleasant. Like, yeah. I, I enjoyed it. I mean, you still has that aftertaste, that rubbery of kind course. of tar-like bitterness on the back end mm. um, that is not, like, my preference or Robusta. not normal for the yeah. U.S. market. Um, but with that said, because Robusta has grown a lot um, and because it costs a fraction of the price of mm. Arabica, would you say that Robusta is important for sustainability for the coffee farmers? Or, like you were saying, Adi is actually moving away from Robusta. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what does all that mean? Like, how, how do we look at that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, you know, if, if people are making money, then you can say it's a need, right? You know, like if you right. just took that income away, it would be like pretty devastating. And, you know, there, there are benefits to Robusta. Like, there's way less maintenance. The production is way higher. Um, so for these, you know, for their lives, you know, which are so communally minded, there are benefits of Robusta where it's like, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to fertilize, I'm, I'm not going to prune, I'm just kind of going to let it do its thing. And then once a year, I'm going to harvest these massive amounts of coffee, like that you could almost say that fits their lifestyle a little bit better because mm -hmm. uh, you were a part of a bunch of ceremonies we visited, like yeah. the locals, uh, indigenous people, they have life cycle ceremonies um, for newborns and and uh, young men uh, that are kind of that go with the moon cycle. So we were invited to a bunch of ceremonies that we we actually we only did maybe one fourth of the time that we could have. You know, we could have filled our time up way more. Um, but so there is benefits for them for Robusta because oh I, don't, I have to do minimal work and I can get lots of coffees. But obviously, you know, the price is way lower and. Um, they drink it, you know, they, they actually don't like Arabica. So I've taken some of our processed Arabica coffee to them, you know, really excited, you know, my, you know, Western minds that this is a beautiful coffee, so exciting, so complex, all these things. I was like, you should try this, like this is your coffee. And they're like, we don't like it. Yeah. Like, hey, if the buyers are happy, we don't care. But like, they have no desire to drink Arabica. Like it's too acidic they're not they don't like it at all yeah so that's why yeah super yeah. i was like that was like the first year i was there and just so funny like yeah. i was super proud like this is yours like taste this and they're just like okay yeah. like are people buying it okay cool that's it like wow. yeah yeah man um as we wrap up the episode uh thanks for sharing all of this info yeah um, we're going to drop the end of the episode with a hot take. Yeah. Um, you and I have talked a lot about sustainability. Yeah. We've talked about what does that mean. And one of the things that I've noticed for me um, before coming on this trip, I viewed sustainability through a very uh, capitalistic mindset. Mm -hmm. That is um, sustainability equals uh, creating more money for the farmer, more mm -hmm. demand, um, for the farmer, uh, therefore uh, elevating the quality of the farmer. Mm -hmm. um, but because that's a value for me in my Western mindset. Mm -hmm. um, but 
that is not the common value that we see here, especially for coffee farmers. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the times, uh, coffee farmers don't see the need to invest into higher quality and uh, putting in more work. Mm -hmm. um, one, like you brought up this example that completely blew my mind. Uh, someone was uh, process or helping you process a coffee. Mm -hmm. um, coffee was fermenting. Um, it needed fermentation needed to stop at 128 hours. Mm -hmm. um, they decided to go to a ceremony at like hour 100 or so mm -hmm. and uh, came back three days later totally and the coffee not completely spoiled, yeah. um, was completely done. Yeah. Um, because the value wasn't the quality of the coffee, the value was uh, the relational concept of mm. the community. Um, so what do, what do we do with talking about sustainability from that point of view? Like, yeah. help us understand, process that. Yeah, that's, uh, it's something I'm still learning, you know, like I'm obviously an outsider and I'm still adapting to this culture. Like my, my wife is Indonesian and she gives me a lot of, you know, beautiful insights, things I wouldn't catch normally. Um, so coming in as a learner, you know, like, yeah, like you said, you get, it's like, we're thinking quality. We're thinking to the minute, to the second, to the millisecond. It's like, this has got to ferment this long and get this pH level. And it's like, oh, like, sorry, I forgot. Like I had other things going on in my life. And like the mindset of how everything is interconnected, like, you know, it's like not only are they coffee farmers, but it's like they have these their roles in these communities of like, you know, showing up for family and, and even giving away their coffee for these ceremonies as well. You know, like they don't always sell all their coffee because they have to think, oh, I've got to supply coffee for, for my cousin's circumcision ceremony or, oh, I know this person's having a ceremony down the road. I'm going to give them some bananas that I can normally sell. So it's like they totally are not, they're not there in their notebook. Oh, net profit, net loss. Uh, if I give this many bananas away, no, it's, oh, my cousin needs this for a ceremony, done. There's not even a second thought. It's, this is my duty. So it's really, a, yeah, it's a lot, I experience a lot of frustrations, you know, yeah. and I'm still looking, how can we meet them in the middle? How can we learn from each other, bridge that gap? You know, like we have these eco tours where we're bringing tourists in and letting them see the farmer's lifestyle and stuff. And so the idea is to learn from each other, you know, mm -hmm. like not say this is good or this is bad and, and put one another down, but it's like, how can we meet here in the middle and, and raise the quality of coffee, raise the quality of their life, but helping them catch that wave and that value as well and, and just meeting in the middle, you know, is obviously the goal. And, and most of all, honoring and loving in that process as well, where it's like, you need to be 100% like me or the West, or you need to be like this coffee producer and you've got to, you know, fix this and fix that. But it's like, hey, like, you know, meet them where they're at and continue, you know, if you don't have love and honor in a relationship and you don't like play with those set of rules or engagements, you know, it's like, it's all worthless anyway and you're yeah. not gonna it's not a sustainable relationship in the end anyways because and we is. have to meet them where like maybe the way that they feel loved is not the way that i think yes so it's like i have to powerful. figure out how do you feel most loved it's like oh does that mean like you know spending eight hours on the farm doing nothing with you sure like hanging out forever like you know just learning what is the way they lo feel loved not the way i think that they should feel yeah. loved you know so and yeah. sustainability is not an easy topic to discuss um yeah, this is a short podcast, so we can't like yeah. get in all the nuance of it. Yeah. But I think uh, the main, my main takeaway, the main thing I've learned on this trip is that you have to approach sustainability from uh, the farmer and the producer side and not from the side of someone like me who's a roaster, cafe, you right. know, manager, like from that perspective. You really have to know what the farmer needs and meet them on their terms um, and create sustainability through their eyes and through their perspective. Um, and that's been challenging, yeah, yeah. because I've noticed how uh, capitalistic uh, I am and how my mindset is really Western. And um, yeah, that's that's a challenge to merge with you. Yeah. So kudos to you. Again, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Uh, second time. It's been a pleasure uh, hanging it's with you, honor, dude. Yeah. I, just, I just love hanging out it's with you, man. Awesome. It's yeah. been, our friendship has, is really dear to me. Um, Likewise. It's a decade in, and uh, it'll it'll go to the grave. I believe it. Yeah, it's like a so, fine wine. It just gets better. With just time. gets better, dude. I appreciate you so much. Absolutely. And thank you, folks, again to uh, for not to for listening to this uh, semi messy episode. Uh, that's the timer because it's coming on thirty minutes here. Um, hopefully, you heard everything. Hopefully, Mark is able to edit this uh, episode well. And I'm going to wrap up before the camera goes by. With that said, folks, remember, where's my mug? Remember, folks, reflect what's good.